Well, I've told you before that you would hear about peanuts and other cartoon characters that are important to me, so that's what's going to happen. But I have at least confessed that. Uh, Charles Schultz, when he was alive, um, I, I think his comic reflections were highly theological and authentically described so much about life and human nature and faith. Uh, there were two books that were studies of his work. One was called The Gospel According to Peanuts, and the other was The Parables of Peanuts. And if you ever find those on a used book, pick them up, because they're very helpful ways of, of understanding his opus. I can recall one instance, one cartoon, when egged on by Lucy's loving adoration, Linus declared, there's no heavier burden than a great potential. <laughs> I wonder how many of us have carried that assessment from our childhoods onward. I can certainly remember parents coming home from school teachers' evenings saying, they say you have great potential, but just don't work enough. <laughs> oh, some, some of you have heard that, have you? <laughs> But it is true that growing up and realizing our potential never ends. And it's important for you, especially if you're coming to my age, that you remember that. Potential still needs to be realized, even though you think that it's over, it's not. Well, the Christian life is just the same as that growing up and realizing potential. We're never to be finished striving to be Christ-like growing up into the fullness of Christ, never to be finished. I stood beside a bed of someone from this congregation who's very close to death, Betty Squires was her name. And as I held her hand and looked in her eyes and she told me about her life in the church, I thought, she's still realizing potential. And even in a hard and painful death was looking with eagerness to what God had before her. I hope I go like that. But I do wonder, in my own life, and frankly in the life of the church, whether our shared potential has been as realized as much as it should have been. I kind of fear that the words potential unrealized would be serving as our epitaph in the church. Given the presence of God in our midst, we say it all the time, there's no other group of people with more potential than the members of the Church of Christ. You hear that? There's no other people with more potential than the members of the Church of Christ. And it's to that very potential that Jesus points in today's Gospel. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. Well, this, this is a stunning promise if you really hear it for what it is. But, but, is that truly our experience? Or have we perhaps settled for something less in our faith experience? These are words from Jesus to his disciples in what we call the farewell discourse in John. And uh, he tells them many, many things and speaks of what life will be like. And they carry significant prophetic weight. We need to pay attention to them. Uh, especially if we say we're followers as well, because they apply to us. If we're required to do greater things than even Jesus, then should we not presume that there are greater things to be about? Of course, there's much to do to be part of the continuing and unfolding reign of God. That hope about the reign of God is to be our mark on the world we are to be people of that hope. I've been in the church long enough. I sometimes think so much of what we occupy ourselves with seems to be about the maintenance of the plant. 
I can, nor, wardens cannot. They understand maintenance of the plant. Sundays come and Sundays go. One bulletin follows another. One committee meeting follows another and so on. And before long, the survival of the same becomes our internal mantra. But I want to tell you that maintenance of what is, or preserving a heritage, can't be enough for the people of God. A great preacher from the early part of the last century, well, uh, yes, early in the last century, Billy Sunday said this, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. <laughs> See, it's what we do on the road that matters. Monday morning tells more about the effectiveness of the church than Sunday morning. That's when our potential is really tested. Perhaps that's what we should be asking ourselves about our own faith lives. What does Tuesday look like? What does Thursday look like? Not what Sunday looks like. If we say, and we do, that we're unsatisfied with how things are in this world of scarcity and justice and fear of Nigerian girls being kidnapped and saying that the kingdom is infiltrating the world is a word of hope. A hope that will prod, entice, or poke us at least into working toward the vision of the kingdom Jesus proclaims. See, hope doesn't just cheer you up. It must move you to action. I saw a sign recently on a construction hoarding wonderful sign it said it's easy to upload but hard to act it's easy to upload but hard to act in an era of an information explosion there is a discontinuity between what we know and what we do about it maybe more now than any time in history we have information coming out every pore of our body. Maybe to the point of inactivity. Maybe we don't know what to do. Christians are supposed to be people of action. If we're people of hope, not doing is not acceptable. Action should be our mantra. Yeah. And acting and asking in Jesus' name is essential to our effectiveness. I think that Jesus offers us like those first followers that first heard his words from John, the hope that God's kingdom is inevitably coming. And why we can't control or even force it or time it, we can anticipate it by looking for it and even, even aiding its unexpected growth. So, what is our responsibility in all this talk of hope in the reign of God? I believe our job in the church is primarily twofold. To scatter seeds and to be a hopeful, healthy community that can welcome the people God calls to grow in its midst. We seed the good news in our relationships, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our families. And we trust that God will bring harvest in due course. We keep running Alpha programs. We continue caring deeply for children and teens, young families, and all ages. We strive to learn more and more about our gospel. In groups and in our liturgies, we continue to be faithful in our financial support. We just do it. And we don't worry too much about how God will harvest. Our great potential is simply to play our assigned role in the spread of the kingdom and to let God be God. But sometimes 
we don't settle for the best. Stories told of a family in Europe in the last century, and the family's business went, went bankrupt, and they were suffering hard times. And the people of the village gathered around the family and said, what can we do to help? And the father said, well, if I could just get somewhere else and have a fresh start, maybe that would help. So the f poor villagers gathered enough to give the family a passage to America, a big, long 14-day passage. And uh, they accepted that gratefully and decided to emigrate. But they didn't really know how to prepare for a voyage on a liner coming to another country. They were poor folk. So what they did was they made a whole bunch of cheese sandwiches and put them in a box. And over the first few days of the voyage, when they were hungry, they simply went to the cheese sandwiches. And they stayed in their steerage passage cabin and didn't see anyone else. They just hunkered down. But they did discover seasickness. And toward the end of the passage, both of the parents were so sick that they couldn't even bear food. And the little boy that was their child begged them for a few pennies so that he could go and buy some candy. He was looking for a treat, as most kids do. And they were able to do that. And the boy went up top of the ship, and they, they didn't know where he went. But he went upstairs and was gone a long time. <laughs> a long time. This has a great sort of memory for me because I emigrated from Britain on the Queen Elizabeth in 1953 when there weren't any stabilizers in March. And my parents in the middle of that voyage were deathly ill. And I, of course, was not. And I was up on deck helping people walk through the ropes and that kind of thing. So that feels familiar to me. My parents didn't have to come looking for me, though. And the father finally came upstairs and came to a room that was full of tables and people eating at them. Not just simple meals, but great meals. Chicken dinners and all of the fixings. And there in the middle of it was his little boy, just tucking right in. And he was outraged, and he went to the little boy and sort of, I didn't shake him, but said, what are you doing? You know I can't afford all of this. And the little boy looked at him and said, Dad, it's okay. It comes with our tickets. We could have eaten like this for the whole trip. Christian life lived properly is a banquet. Sometimes we settle for second or third best. Packing sandwiches in the steerage instead of feasting in the dining room with our captain. Let's expect the best. More than we can ask or imagine. More than even Jesus it did. And do it in his name. That's what this faith is to be about. It's not a dreary thing. It's not without challenges. But it's not without ultimate victory. Thanks be to God. Amen.